Good evening and welcome to this special Concord Museum Forum, Antisemitism Then and Now, which we've organized with our co-sponsors to mark International Holocaust Remembrance Day, which is celebrated tomorrow. Let me begin by thanking those co-sponsors. First and foremost, our media sponsor, the Boston Globe, who ran a free quarter page ad in Monday's paper, which has led to this record turnout uh, for this evening's program. I'd also like to thank alphabetically the Concord Carlisle Human Rights Council, Hadassah, Karim Shalom, and the Vilna Shul Boston Center for Jewish Culture, whose executive director, Dalit Horn, will close out this evening's program. This is not the first time the museum has marked International Holocaust Remembrance Day. Before the pandemic struck, we featured the film Exile and Community, The Life of Carola Domar, a Holocaust survivor who lived and raised her family in Concord. While Concord played key roles in our nation's history in 1775 and during the Transcendentalist period, its history did not end there. I want to thank my friend, historian Bob Gross, for initially suggesting Charles Gallagher, uh, one of our tonight's speakers to us. Uh, no one knows more about Concord's history than Professor Gross, and I asked him about what he knew about the earliest members of the Jewish community in Concord. He, of course, had already looked into this himself and reports that in his search of Concord census records for 1900, he discovered quite a few Jews in the town among the following Russian and German-born inhabitants, Samuel Gussman, Maurice Goldberg, Max Katz, Morris Shane, Simon Siegel, and David Wolfson. He also discovered that the first recorded mention of a Jewish family in Concord was in 1885. That happened to be Bertram Filene, who kept a store briefly on the Mill Dam, which was the center of the town's commercial district. Turns out that Bertram was the younger brother of Edward Filene, the founder of Filene's department store and its famous bargain basement. We have much ground to cover, so I'll keep my introductions of our speakers very brief. I also want to mention, I fear we won't have too much time for audience questions, but I hope to include one or two. Um, the easiest way to submit those is to email those to me, and I'll read them off my phone. And my email address is tputnam at concordmuseum.org, T-P-U-T-N-A-M at concordmuseum, all one word, dot org. I'll read through your questions as they come in and do my best to pose one or two. And now to our speakers, Charles Gallagher is an associate professor of history at Boston College. He's a Jesuit priest who has celebrated mass here in Concord on many occasions. He's also been a member of the Jewish Catholic Roundtable in neighboring Bedford. His book, Vatican Secret Diplomacy, won the Shea Prize from the American Catholic Historical Association. David Shriven is the former executive editor of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. He's a regular columnist for the Boston Globe where he wrote a review of Professor Gallagher's book, Nazis of Copley Square, The Forgotten Story of the Christian Front. Both David and I would highly recommend um, reading the book uh, if you have not done so already. Earlier in David's career, he was the Globe's assistant managing editor, columnist, and the Washington Bureau Chief. He was awarded the Pulitzer Prize in 1995 for his coverage of Washington and the American political scene. And under his leadership, the Pittsburgh Gazette won a Pulitzer for its coverage of the tragic shootings at the Tree of Life Synagogue and Squirrel Hill, which David will comment on uh, in a moment. Uh, having been raised Catholic, it will be hard for me, Father Gallagher, to call you Charlie during the evening, but since you've given me leave to do so, I will follow your orders. Uh, so you write in the introduction of your book that your focus is on the intersection of religion with paramilitarism and a mangled version of theology that emerged on the East Coast in the mid to late uh, 1930s. So we're gonna bring up the PowerPoint uh, presentation. Uh, and I'm going to try to help piece those, some of those things through, including religion, paramilitarism, and theology. Uh, so maybe we'll go to the next slide. Um, and I wanted you to start uh, with uh, the gentleman on the right, uh, Father Coghlan, uh, who uh, is a key figure here in the United States. And then we'll go back to uh, Arnold Lung. But tell us a little bit about who Father Coghlan was. Uh, you're, you're muted, Charlie, for some reason. There you go. So Father Charles Coughlin was a priest from Detroit, Michigan, who was probably the foremost and first celebrity priest of the 19, of the 20th century. He used the medium of radio to gather crowds from coast to coast. He, um, he had as many as 30 million listeners during the late 1940s. To put that in perspective, 
uh, a few years ago, the largest television audience for a, for a, a weekly TV show was America's Got Talent. It had 12 million viewers a week. This priest had 30 million listeners every week on his radio. He was very politicized. And between after 1936 and 1937, he became increasingly anti-Semitic in his rhetoric on the radio. And one of the ideas that catapulted him forward in his anti-Semitism was this fixation on starting what he called a Christian front. Let's just talk about the gentleman who uh, is on the left, because uh, it's part of a larger movement that you call ecumenical anti-communism. Just tell us a little bit what that was about. Right. So the gentleman on my left is a British philosopher. And in his spare time, he was the founder. He was the father of slalom skiing. <laughs> his name is Arnold Lunn. Uh, so he's, he's uh, hanging out at the University of Oxford in the 1930s converts to Catholicism from Methodism, and his father is a, is a high-ranking Methodist clergyman, he feels a little bit of guilt about his conversion to Catholicism. So when the Spanish Civil War emerges and he, as a journalist, travels to Spain, he starts writing stories and sees that the communist or popular front government seems to be meeting out what he calls a persecution against Catholics uh, during the period uh, after 1936, 1936, 1938. And there were a number of uh, atrocities committed against Catholic clergy during a, about an 18 month period uh, after 1937. And so he, as a Catholic, decides to motivate Christians worldwide to uh, come together as a kind of a spiritual front. There's no paramilitarism involved for him. He wants to bring Christians together and spiritually create a block to create awareness of what's going on in Spain against what he considers, you know, fellow, fellow Christians. And so he calls it an ecumenical style of anti-communism, but it's completely, it's, it's completely benign for him. It's, it's much more spiritually focused, uh, but then Coughlin gets a hold of it after 1938 and uh, twists it to his own uses. And in my view, he, he's the one who paramilitarizes uh, this idea of the Christian front. Let's go to the next slide, um, Allison. And, um, mm. uh, again, we won't have time to kind of piece all of this together, but can, can you talk about this, um, uh, why it becomes anti-Semitic and the notion of communism and Judaism, how those two are combined? Right. So part of Coughlin's Christian Front idea now is removed from Lund, and, and uh, Coughlin is introducing the element of what's known as Judeo-Bolshevism, the myth that Jews and communists were, were synonymous in creating uh, communism, Leninist communism after 1917. So Coughlin will say things like, uh, argue to his Catholic listeners, Marx was a Jew, Marx's grandfather was Jewish, Therefore, Marxism itself was a plot. Lenin had Jewish lineage. That had been unproven at the time. Uh, and so consequently, he melds the two and says that the two, the two great founders of, of Marxism-Leninism were Jewish. Those, those, uh, uh, ad their adherents are um, meeting out persecutions against Christians globally, uh, both in the, during the time of the Russian Revolution up through the Spanish Civil War, and then also a big persecution against Catholics in Mexico. Although the government in Mexico didn't identify as a communist because it was socialistic, most Catholics, you know, it, it, it walked like a duck and it quacked like a duck. So Coughlin was able to say that this was, this was basically global communism meeting out a, um, a, a, a military response against uh, Christianity worldwide, but particularly Catholicism. The other problem is that there are theologies circulating within Catholicism known as Catholic action, which started out as a social uplift movement, but became more aggressively anti-communist. And then mystical body of Christ theology, which is a kind of a, 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 an ecclesiology of who Christ is, which, which is based in St. Paul and, and, and kind of creates a transnational style of international Catholicism, that what happens to a Christian somewhere else in the world, it's, it's this Pauline theology of the part to the whole, the, the, the head to the body, that if a Christian is, is maligned in Barcelona um, or, or 
meted out with, you know, put up against a wall in a firing squad in Barcelona, that the Christian church, the Christian body of Christ uh, is, is, um, is injured by that in Boston. And so it, it creates this, it's kind of this, this vortex. That's why I have the funnel, which brings about, in my view, an, this anti-Semitic paramilitarism that no one's really looked at yet. And then it'll lead to that in New York, in the case of the Christian Front. And then in Boston, it'll merge into active espionage for the National Socialist Party. Let's go to the next slide, uh, Allison. Uh, well, I think we got yeah, to go to the That's um, fine. So uh, just... Um, a big part of the book, the, uh, the, the third chapter of the book is about the sedition case in New York, where the Christian Front was placed on trial in the spring and summer of 1940. And you can read about this in the book. It's a fascinating study of these Roman Catholics charged with the overthrow of the U.S. government in a, in a very um, uh, far-flung case, a very, uh, very um, uh, amazing case that is, uh, and, and we can keep forwarding through these slides here. Um, and, and, uh, and, and this is really the, the, the height of the paramilitarism. They, they're arming themselves. They're making bombs in the basement. They have a plan to try to uh, create an insurrection starting in New York City and moving to the Capitol in order to uh, overthrow the U.S. government because their fear was that President Roosevelt, who had moved Jews into his cabinet-level positions and onto the Supreme Court, were those Jews were in fact communists and and needed to be taken taken down that that the Roosevelt administration needed to be taken out because he uh, Roosevelt was infil having Jews slash communists uh, infiltrate the U.S. government. They were going to lead this defensive counterattack strategy to take out the government. They were going to detonate bombs all throughout New York and blame it on communists then have the governor of New York, Governor Lehman, call out the National Guard. The Christian Front had infiltrated the National Guard, and these National Guard members, along with Christian Front paramilitaries, were going to move alongside the National Guard to put down the communist insurrection and reclaim the United States for Christianity. And the people who would be doing this would be Catholics. And so they, they felt that they were doing their patriotic duty by starting this crazy, fantastic, a uh, strange um, plot and and trying to put that into action. Uh, Alison, let's go to the next slide because um, uh, I'm going to skip over some of this. I warned Charlie that I would yeah. do this because uh, uh, I really want to get to Boston. Um, right. So uh, there's a there's a trial yeah. and uh, they're found not guilty. Yeah. But it's uh, it's a fascinating story. Yeah. So now let's go to Boston and uh, I'll let you walk us through this slide. Yeah, so now we're in Boston, and what I'm showing here is that the man uh, uh, on, the, on the far right of my screen um, is Herbert Scholz. He's a Nazi that no one has written about, no academic has written about. I was able to track down uh, his, his path to, uh, to Boston, and uh, this, this, this uh, kind of series of photos shows his lineage in the Nazi system. He, uh, as a young man in the early 1920s, joined the Brown Shirts and became particularly a, a particular friend of Ernst Rom, who, along with Hitler, founded the Brown Shirts, known as the SA, the Sturm Abteilung. Um, in the past couple of days, I got an email from a woman whose great grandmother um, sheltered Scholes on the night of the long knives, that was when Himmler and, and Hitler were trying to eliminate the leadership of the brown shirts. Um, and and a, fa a fascinating story about that came through. And it, but that showed that um, Scholz was beholden to the first Rome. He ended up working in the Nazi um, headquarters, Nazi party headquarters in Munich, known as the Brown House, where he was poached by Heinrich Himmler because Scholz had gone and gotten a PhD in psychology and philosophy at Leipzig, and Himmler didn't have as many uh, men. The Rome's group had about three million, and Himmler's group uh, had in the thousands. And so he wanted prestige. He he poached Scholz. Scholz moved into the Brown House. This is where Hitler had his office as well on the first floor, and then started working as a, basically an aide de camp to Rudolf Hess. Who, is, who ultimately becomes the deputy Führer after 1933. So this is a Nazi no one's ever heard of. He ends up in Boston in 1938. 
and we can go to the next slide. But that's his lineage. He comes to Boston because another thing no one knew about was that um, when he was assigned here, all the press thought it was a, that, that it was a demotion for him in the diplomatic corps. He was under diplomatic cover and he was sent to Boston as the consul. Heinrich Brüning was the former chancellor of Germany and he was teaching at Harvard and becoming more vocally anti-Hitler. When Scholz arrives, this gentleman, Francis Moran is living in Boston and an adherent to Father Coughlin. He's Father Coughlin's foot soldier in Boston. Um, and you can read about him in the book, a fascinating character. Uh, and he uh, moves forward, uh, becomes, um, and reaches out to Scholes. And Scholes ends up giving him direction and, and support uh, to keep the Christian front alive in Boston, which you can, which you can read about in the book, that just that. And he does it by paying for Moran's um, organization to have a suite of rooms in the Copley Square Hotel. So that's why the title of the book is Nazis of Copley Square, is the Christian Front had their headquarters at the Copley Square Hotel, right down there by Heinz Convention Center. This is another photograph of Scholz and his wife, Lilo von Schnitzler. And uh, her family is a, a prominent fam uh, industrial family from Munich. This is Scholz at the consulate in Boston on Chestnut Street, which is right near the State House. Uh, Charlie, just stop again and explain. So, what what is Scholz doing in Boston? What's his? What? Is, why did Hitler send him here? I think you. Yeah. So. What, yeah. So. Yeah. So um, after Kristallnacht, uh, early November of 1938, the the, the Jewish uh, pogrom outrages against the Jews in Germany. Bruning, as the former chancellor of the Weimar Republic, um, had been silent in his work at Harvard for years since from 1937, uh, when he came over in 37, he'd been silent. After Kristallnacht, Bruning started going public and making anti-Hitler speeches up and down the East Coast. And uh, from what we can tell, Himmler and Hitler decided to send a, a heavyweight over to Boston, who was Scholz, in order to clamp down on on uh, Bruning. And basically, Scholz showed up, and you can read about it in the book, he ran an intimidation campaign. But basically, Scholz showed up and said, the Gestapo knows where all your relatives live in Germany if you don't clam up. Um, you know, Scholl, uh, Bruning knew what the prospects would be. So he basically so, took, he took, he took Bruning off the playing field and then I, became an energetic spy master. I think the next slide is that the Nazi flag is the chilling image. Yeah, tell yeah. us what this is. So this is the spring of 1940, shortly after the invasion of the Low Country, and um, this is two blocks from the State House. And again, it's where Schultz is, has his office. And yeah, that's the that's the consulate there, and and he's meeting secretly with Moran, who, as you can read about in the book, he's Moran himself is fluent in German. He's an I Irish Catholic kind of working class fellow, rather bookish, and he's an ex-Catholic seminarian. And when he's in the Catholic seminary, he learns to speak German. Huh. And uh, he meets there with Joel secretly after in the summer of 1940. So we're, gonna, we're running so short on time. But there's the, now yeah. there's an effort to kind of infiltrate Joel and Moran and overthrow them. Why don't you tell us what the Brits? Uh, yeah, so as we move forward, we've got a bunch of different intelligence agencies uh, coming to the awareness that Scholz and Moran, well, not coming to the awareness, no one knows that Scholz is working with Moran. Even members of the Christian Front don't know that Moran is working with Scholz. But British intelligence kind of figures that the Christian Front has an uptick in membership and activity, and British intelligence in New York, the head office in New York, decides to run an intelligence campaign on American soil illegally <laughs> um, and uh, comes to Boston in, the, in, in 1941 because they see all this. Then we have five different intelligence agencies surveilling the Christian front at that time. We can go to the next slide. Yeah. So British intelligence needs someone on the ground in Boston to run their operation and they find a news reporter named Francis Sweeney, who's very much a Catholic liberal, 
of a very, one of the very few Catholic liberals at the time, very astute, very, um, very devout Catholic. And she is uh, kind of the her heroine of the story. She, she believes that the anti-Semitism exhibited by Coughlin and Moran in the Christian front is sinful. And, you know, it took, takes 25 more years for the Catholic Church to officially proclaim that. So she's decades ahead of her time, and she decides to work for British intelligence unwittingly through a, this front organization called the Irish American Defense Association. She does that um, as a, kind of a under a religious impulse. And eventually Moran is detained. He's not actually arrested because of freedom right. of speech. But uh, the Boston police, I mean, they, they do um, uh, essentially with the support of MI6, uh, uh, help to prevent uh, or, or at least delay or, you know, interfere with what Moran's trying to do. Correct. Yeah. The British intelligence more or less orchestrates the Boston police to take down Moran at the street level. Um, although the Boston, all the Irish cops in Boston have no idea they're being manipulated by the British. That's another <laughs> great thing about the book. So we can go to the next, we can go to the next slide. Yeah. These are just some documents I found in this in the archive secret documents. I thought that your viewers might like to see. You know, there's a Boston address. That's a letter uh, signed by Sweeney. It was found in the secret files of the Special Operations Executive in London. That's Winston Churchill's private subversive warfare uh, operational unit. I just think that's cool to look at. Yeah. I think we need to push. Yeah. So this is. Um, a headline of one of the daily magazines, a nationwide magazine. Um, these are some documents about the Catholic on Jewish violence that erupts in Boston. And the really it started in the in the uh, spring of 1943 and goes on through the fall. And I, I, I imply in the book that it's Moran working with Scholes. Scholes had been expelled from the U.S. in 1941. This is a uh, this is a U.S. Army counterintelligence a core document about these riots that are taking place. And I'm arguing that, I'm implying that it's basically Moran in his basement taking his cues from Scholz over in Germany. Scholz is now the aide de camp to Karl Wolf, who's the highest ranking SS general uh, um, in, in Germany. We can go to the so next slide. It's, it's, it's the Catholic versus Jewish uh, riot. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Brutal, brutal rioting that went on that, that Stephen Norwood has written about it academically. But my sources are saying that it started much earlier and could have been much more violent. This is a guy named. So the question was, why is this forgotten? Because the subtitle of the book is The Forgotten History of the Christian Front. So this is an F FBI assistant director who um, who was able to recruit um, a, a, a person in Boston who was who had come forward through a middleman saying that Scholes had tried to recruit them to join a secret circle to do spying. Um, and when the FBI tried to recruit that person to actually report to the FBI, that that person reneged because um, because he was fearful for his life. So one of the reasons I'm saying it's forgotten is that they couldn't the FBI couldn't infiltrate Scholes's spying because people were afraid they'd be killed. And we can uh, push enter for the next thing. This is also, towards the end of the book, the Christian Front goes underground. And finally, by about 1944, the FBI is able to get a, a confidential informant, a woman, into the cell structure of the Christian Front. It's diminished into a cell structure. And she, so Hoover then, J. Edgar Hoover, the head of the FBI, now they have an informant inside the cell structure. Hoover tries to get informant T1 to testify against Moran in a court of law. She reneges because she's also fearful for her life. So it's another reason why I think it's forgotten. And it really shows the lethality of Scholes. And so what I'm trying to do is connect inter Holocaust, International Holocaust Remembrance Day to the lethality of Scholes. Scholl's Nazism in Boston is lethal. And I think that's good to remember during this time. And we can go to the next slide. And it's terrible that I, I'm getting ahead of it, but you know, he, he's never even held accountable. And, and yeah, yeah. Uh, Scholl's gets off scot-free. Moran gets off scot-free. 
Um, and, you know, the, the FBI prosecuted a number of people who they thought were spies and really weren't during World War II. I can let your viewers just read that. This is um, confidential informant T1. This is directly from the FBI file where Moran, this is in, uh, you can, you can, in April of 1943, Moran is saying that he's, um, he, he wants to exterminate uh, Jews. Mm -hmm. And so talk, we're talking about anti-Semitism then. I thought I'd bring this out of the files to let your viewers see that that this this is real stuff and uh, it's it's um, it, it, it's it needs a lot of repair that's and uh, that's one of the reasons why I like to do this research. And so we can yeah. we can turn to the next slide. That's yeah. yeah. And then I know uh, Tom, you were interested in this slide if and and you can take it from here to close out if you'd like. Well, no, I'll, I'll have you read it because you know that the but uh, tell. Frances Sweeney has a heart attack and she dies. Her fiance pens this letter, and as he said, she's the heroine of the story. Maybe you can read the words. Yeah. So this is this is a, an excerpt from a letter I found uh, from her fiance after she passed away suddenly, and it reads, "I it just doesn't seem right that one who could see so much evil around her and spared neither time nor courage to fight it should suddenly be taken away. To us who are left behind, her." Deeds should be a challenge to carry on the good work she started. Uh, and that's certainly we gather tonight in that spirit. Uh, yeah. David, we'll, we'll turn to you. Uh, you reviewed the book for the Globe. Uh, your reaction to it? I don't know if you want to have a comment, maybe a question to Charlie. Well, first of all, I thought it was an astonishing uh, piece of uh, scholarship and uh, much needed and filled in uh, a blank in, in Boston history that we didn't even know was a blank. And I guess, uh, yeah. uh, Charlie, um, one of the things I noted in my review was that that the work of the uh, of the front wasn't exactly unknown uh, to people in Boston. It was quite public. And how come um, how come uh, you and I by about the same age we never heard about this? Is it because of um, people who were mortified, humiliated that, that such a thing should happen in the cradle of liberty, or is it because it was thrown under the carpet? Or what's your theory on that? Why did it surprise yeah. both of us, in other words? So I think there's a, um, there's a historical reason, and then there's a professional reason. And the historical reason is um, mm -hmm. all, of, all of this history after the liberation of the camps, after the Holocaust becomes known, it's entirely unseemly. It's unseemly for the U.S. government because they weren't able to prosecute the Christian front uh, uh, properly. And, um, and again, no one knows that Moran got away and Scholes got away with what they did until the book was published in September. No, nobody knew any of that story. So there's, uh, and it's, un and so, and then the secondly, it's unseemly on the part for the church to go back and look at this. And, and, and that's why as a, as a priest, I feel that I'm kind of compelled to do that because I think in, in terms of kind of working as a moral person, um, it's good, you know, it, it's good to bring this up and, and revisit it for issues of repair, of moral repair. The professional reason, uh, just quickly, the professional reason is, a, a big part of the professional reason is that I started this project 10 years ago and I was wandering in the wilderness. The, professionally, the history of the right wing was very difficult to get written. Nobody wants to write about the, no historians wanted to tackle the right wing because many liberal historians had said for decades uh, that we can't really create a history of the extreme right, of the right, because that gives the, the, the right credibility, that gives their ideas credibility. And that, that thinking started back in the 1930s. And it kind of, persisted through when I was in grad school and when I kept going, but I kept plugging away. I thought, because I saw this group as an anomaly in American history. I saw a bunch of Catholics trying to overthrow the government. You don't hear about that every day. And I thought, well, Charlie. there's probably, there's probably a big, well, <laughs> until recently. <laughs> okay. So Char Charlie, um, I was born 12 years after the Nazi flag was flying about a mile a half mile from the Boston Public Library. Okay, let's mm -hmm. put it in geographical perspective. I, I spent an entire lifetime 
you know, studying and learning about history, particularly of Massachusetts history. I had never heard about this. I never heard of it. No one ever spoke of spoke of it. I mean, the notion that a Nazi flag was flying, you know, in, in Copley Square uh, is, mm -hmm. it, it was inconceivable to me. When I saw the title of your book, I asked to review it because I couldn't, couldn't imagine that, uh, that this had happened because and it had been basically forgotten much as embarrassing yeah. history has been forgotten, but no one forgot Father Coughlin. I grew up hearing about Father Coughlin. So did you. Yeah. And so, I mean, what interested me were these, well, first were these paramilitaries because they were armed to the teeth. And, uh, and I just decided to keep digging away. Um, but one of, one of the viewers uh, on tonight's um, uh, um, Zoom has e sent me an email ahead of time saying that um, that he'd finished the book and that although we're about the same age, um, that he doesn't remember anything except good relations between Catholics and Jews in Boston when he was growing up. But he does remember, he did remember his parents talking about the high level of anti-Semitism in the, in the 30s and 40s. And so um, I think, I just think that there was a period after the camps were liberated from, from 1945 to about the mid 1960s, where Americans just wanted to get back to doing what they had normally been doing. And the, I, and the concept of the Holocaust hadn't solidified yet. And the other thing too is the, the interrogation report of Scholes and where Scholes is interrogated by the Department of Justice after the war and he spills the beans on his secret work in Boston, that was published in the in the um, public domain in 1961, and well, I, I stumbled. Yeah, go ahead. I think the fact and, that Cardinal Cushing had Jewish nephews and nieces, and yeah, uh, he, he was a rich figure. That I think people said, "Well, that's good enough," and we'll just move on. I think you're right. Yeah, I, I think that's was it. and and because of that attitude, all of them. It was massive press coverage of Moran and the Christian Front during that period. Um, and so all of that just got placed into the files and washed away. Well, no one talks about the Boston Braves either, anymore either, so it's the same thing. <laughs> I'm going to switch us now and ask you, David, just to recount the terrible story about uh, what happened at the Tree of Life Synagogue. And then I want to move to a conversation about what's uh, the same about the issues we face today to what uh, Charlie's written right. about. Anyway, well, just I, bring it back I think to the story. I think the story at the Tree of Life is well known, but I'll... I'll, I'll give you the, my personal uh, story about it. It occurred three blocks from my home. I was um, at the gym on the exercise bike when I got a call uh, from a friend of mine who uh, said he had just been walking down uh, Wilkins Avenue, which uh, intersects my own street, and uh, said he saw police officers walking backwards out of the tree of life shooting a gun. Well, that, as Charlie says earlier, that you don't see that every day in Squirrel Hill. Uh, where, um, uh, which is kind of a peaceable kingdom, uh, where the uh, clock tower at the center of uh, Murray and Forbes, which is the center of, of Squirrel Hill, uh, has a clock where the um, numbers are in Hebrew, and where um, every one of my uh, Gentile friends uh, plays basketball at the Jewish Community Center. So you don't see this every day. So um, being a, a um, trained newsman, I knew that, uh, I'm not trying to be, um, flip about this, but I knew there was something serious was going on. I got off the bike and for some reason I drove to Squirrel Hill. Um, I couldn't get anywhere near the synagogue uh, because it had been cordoned off by police officers. Um, uh, I had put the laundry in the washing machine before I left the gym and in the middle of this signature crisis of Squirrel Hill, I went back into the house and moved the laundry from the washer to the dryer. I later found some subliminal um, significance in that, and that I was looking for some kind of cleansing and wanted to sleep on clean sheets that night. I don't know why I did that, but I did in that in that uh, moment did what I newsmen always do in crises, and that, that is I went to the office, and um, we uh, as I, as I was driving there, I had a conversation on the phone with the city editor. Uh, her name was Lillian Thomas. She is a fabulous journalist, uh, the type of person who has a police. A scanner in her in her um, breakfast table at home. She had heard what's going on. She explained to me uh, that there were some officers down and that it looked bad. Um, she immediately came into the office 
uh, to learn within the hour that her family physician had been among the 11 killed. Um, this was a signal moment in the life of our community. Squirrel Hill once was, oh, I'd say 65% Jewish. Now it's probably 40, 45% Jewish. The local high school is full of Jewish kids. Um, there are 11 synagogues within a mile of my home. Um, every Friday night uh, and Saturday morning, you see uh, Orthodox Jews walking to synagogue um, in their distinctive garb. There are uh, kosher restaurants um, within a couple blocks of my house. The only Dunkin' Donuts that is rabbinically um, uh, determined to be kosher in the country is at the corner uh, down the street. Um, so this is a community where Jews and Catholics and Protestants and others uh, mingled easily uh, and happily um, without a trace of anti-Semitism, without a trace of rancor uh, group to group, a remarkable place. Um, and the least anti-Semitic place I'd ever lived. I lived, uh, grew up in the North Shore of Boston, uh, went to college in uh, New Hampshire at Dartmouth College, um, where by the way, Charlie the Slalom was actually invented there, uh, not by a friend. And I have uh, documentary evidence to prove that being the historian of Dartmouth College and, um, and lived in Buffalo, uh, Washington and Pittsburgh. And this is the most remarkably um, uh, tolerant, a community, and when I use the word tolerance, people recall at that in Pittsburgh because it's not tolerance, it's um, differences were embraced there. To this day, Tom, um, on the Starbucks, there's a, um, there's a uh, Jewish star uh, on the window. Uh, you walk through, um, you walk through um, uh, Forbes Avenue, which you can, you might imagine to have been the, um, the uh, Coolidge Corner of Pittsburgh, or I, I kind of think of um, kind of think of uh, Pittsburgh, uh, Pittsburgh Squirrel Hill as being the um, being the Brooklyn in the 1950s. And there are signs still that say um, "Eight has no place here" or "Squirrel Hill Solidarity" and this sort of thing. Uh, this brought a community that already was pretty much together, even more so. Um, we saw a remarkable um, uh, convergence of people at the corner of. Um, of Forbes and Murray, where generally people will congregate when the Steelers win the Super Bowl, which they have done six times, or when the um, Penguins win the Stanley Cup, we won't speak about the Pirates. Um, but that's where people can congeal at important moments. And uh, it was Alderdice High School, on the matter of my older daughter, students who organized a kind of a prayer vigil. And it was a remarkable moment for Pittsburgh. It was a tragic, tragic thing. Um, I walked by the Tree of Life every day, seven days a week. Um, it is, as, as I say, three blocks from the house. Uh, it's my walking route. Um, it is boarded up. It's um, kind of a uh, symbol of, um, of uh, unrequited hopes and of tragedy. And um, I never fail to feel sobered and um, with a chill whenever I walk by there every day. David, tell so us about the editorial, famous editorial decision you made. And I think we have an image of it. Let's see if we have that. This is the front page of the Post-Gazette on Friday, which is five days, six days, I guess, after the shootings. Um, you'll notice the headline uh, is not in English. Um, it is the first four words of the Jewish mourners prayer. Um, I thought in the, in the middle of the night, on Wednesday night, don't forget we put out Friday's paper on Thursday. And you begin to think about Friday's paper on Wednesday night. On Wednesday night, in the middle of the night, I thought, well, maybe we should do this in Hebrew. And um, everybody said I was nuts and that it was a bad idea. Um, but I thought it was a good idea, actually. And I had had um, dinner or kind of supper on that um, Thursday night with a bunch of rabbis who were in town. Um, because one of the rabbis was from the synagogue in Montreal that had married my parents, where my parents had been married, I should say. Um, and uh, they thought it was a KO day idea, but a little risky. Um, so we didn't have a Hebrew font um, at the paper. We didn't use it that often, as you can imagine. So I asked my rabbi, uh, Jamie Gibson uh, of Temple Sinai, to give me the four words 
and we would just take it. And if you'll see the last letter, you, you know that Hebrew is written from uh, opposite the, from the way um, English is written. So the last letter would be on the far left. And that is a, a silent letter called a hey. Well, that prompted the most remarkable um, correction, I think, in the history of journalism that I found myself writing because Rabbi Gibson gave me the version of this prayer in Hebrew. But in fact, the prayer is written in Aramaic and the last letter shouldn't have been that kind of um, three-sided uh, three um, square, but a hey, which is kind of like a, um, a single, uh, but uh, a yud, which is kind of like a single um, quotation mark. So I had to write a correction saying that we had a misspelling in our headline. I don't think anybody really uh, is holding a grudge over that. Um, the explanation I, I give for that is that when words seem to fail you, then maybe you're thinking in the wrong language. And I thought that this would be, this made a statement. Uh, I'm very proud of it. Um, and um, it's probably our most famous headline, uh, and it got a lot of attention. Uh, Selgim, we're so short on time. I'm going to switch to this more complicated question. of We, we posed this as anti-Semitism then and now, and I'm actually going to read your words, Charlie, but they uh, were ones that David highlighted uh, in his review um, that uh, these, this is David writing, uh, Gallagher takes pain to explain that the Christian front differed in some important ways from right-wing extremists of our time. It was not a white supremacist group, nor did it celebrate the Confederacy. Um, he's above all precise and fair-minded, urging readers not to apply 2020's perspective to 1940s events. But again, this, this is a huge question, but um, the question of what you studied uh, and what we've and, and the incidents that we just heard at the end, David, I may have you share your comments about what happened in Texas, but let's stick right now just with this general question of what what's similar in terms of the anti-Semitism of the 1940s to what we see increasingly today and what's different. Charlie, we'll start with you. Yeah, so I've I've been thinking about these questions um, for the past number of years. Uh, because when I write about Catholicism, I, I always have in the back of my mind that I'm writing about religion writ large. And um, what, I, what I like to write about is that there is a, um, there's, there's a problem when believers in religions can take authentic theology and um, not distort it and not hijack it and not twist it, but prostitute it for their own um, either political or asymmetric uh, uh, activities. In other words, you can, um, you can cherry pick theologically, and that's what I think the Christian Front did. They, they, they cherry picked the anti-Semitism that was baked into the Catholic theology of the time. Um, in other words, you know, there were there were no Francis Sweeney's making policy in the Vatican at that time. Uh, that didn't come for another 25 years. And so anti-Semitism was baked in to Roman Catholicism for reasons you can read about in the book. And what Francis Moran and, and particularly what Scholes was able to do was to take that authentic teaching that that status of um, that real status theologically and twist it so that and, and and kind of prostitute it toward Moran so that so that he could morally accept working for a Nazi and it's it's um it's just a chilling story that 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 came across and uh, it was um, it was a remarkable story to be able to research and to write, but that's that's kind of where I where I stand about it. I, I think it's 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 um, it, it's about being able to discern the use of real and authentic theologies that will alt so that they do not violate the law of love. Thank you, uh, David. This, this well, I, I'd like to actually put in perspective a little bit. 
um, you know, we're talking about American anti-Semitism here, and even though, uh, you know, Father Charlie's um, folks had ties to Nazi Germany, they were Americans. Uh, to, to Jews, throughout the generations, from the very beginning, through the, through the day after, day before yesterday, Jews have regarded America as kind of the prom a promised land, if not the promised land. It's where they, it's where they had the chance uh, to breathe free, to, to pray without, uh, without any um, restraints, uh, to raise their children with um, classic American hopes, to send them to, to good colleges, to send, to send them some, from time to time to Boston College. Um, to uh, to prosper and to flourish and to and to to transform themselves from visitors to America to the host community of America and I think Jews today feel that they're part of America's hosts rather than America's visitors. This episode in um, in uh, Pittsburgh and its um, its cousin in Texas the other day. Uh, jolted that confidence, jolted that narrative, and it made it seem as if um, America wasn't that much different from uh, the Russia of the Tsars or the, the Germany of the Nazis uh, or of the, of the uh, persecution uh, in the Polish Pale and other places. And so these episodes are um, terrifying because of, their, of the violence but I think the violence that they that they wreak is even more terrifying because of what it does to the spirit of people who have embraced this country um, as their own and who have um, who have decided to jump in fully to become fully American, enthusiastic American, um, and to praise America for its great values. And so this was an attack not only the on the in my case the eleven Jews, but on this idea. And I think it's been a very, very profound effect on all Jews from coast to coast and over all generations. And I think that's the great danger here. I, I want to be careful. I don't want to get us to be too partisan, um, but I also want to confront the reality. I mean, as an American, you know, the word sedition and insurrection, uh, you know, even in the 1930s seemed, well, that doesn't happen here. And then we just experienced something where individuals have been so uh, riled up. And I wanted to read another quote uh, that, uh, David, you used in your um, review of uh, Professor Gallagher's book. So these are, uh, the book is more than an account of Boston in wartime. It is a warning, quote, the political rhetoric of the Christian front feels remarkably contemporary, Gallagher writes. Fronters were adept at cloaking their anti-Semitism and a shroud of deniability knit from terms such as globalism and international anchors. Um, um, if either of you kind of want to comment on, on kind of this, uh, you know, the thin veil of these words and what is sometimes underneath them, but uh, Charlie. Well, I just want to point out, Tom, that you are sitting in Concord, Massachusetts, which itself was the site of a rebellion and a revolution. Rebellions right. and revolutions are not unknown. Um, in the United States, uh, where I live, we're not that far from where the Whiskey Rebellion was. Um, the uh, Civil War was itself a, a, a rebellion. Uh, rebellions are part of our history, um, but hating, hating oursel ourselves and um, members of our community who have contributed to our civic life in a positive way and who, who share the values of the broader public, well, that's, that's, that's an entirely different thing and very terrifying in my mind. Thank you. Charlie, any comment on your own quote in the book? Yeah, what was coming across, what, what was astonishing to me as I was doing my research and the writing on those areas was how similar some of the uh, language, um, for example, the Christian fronters were talking about globalization uh, they were talking about immigration. Um, they were talking about anti-communism and um, vociferously. And uh, I see all of those impulses being talked about today um, in, in very antagonistic terms. And I was surprised that in 1939, 
1940, they were as uh, front and center uh, as they seem to be today. Hmm. I wanted to add one thing, Tom, that relates to both uh, Charlie and to me. We're both members of faiths that uh, take pride in welcoming the stranger. Um, in the episode about 10 days ago in Texas, Rabbi Charlie invited that gentleman, not a gentleman, that man in for tea. Uh, that man eventually hel held him hostage. We all know the story of the people who were killed in the black church in um, South Carolina. That man was invited in uh, uh, by, uh, by the priest, by the minister, excuse me, for, um, to join a Bible study. So I wanted to ask Father Gallagher, are we in a position now where we, where we, we don't invite in the stranger anymore? No, I've been thinking about that. I, I hope not, um, but um, it, it, it seems to me as though uh, a discernment in that direction may have to take place um, just in connection to how we reach out to others. And if um, our faiths compel us not to limit our reach, um, but there, we also um, need to uh, take into account safety and legitimate defense um, principles. And, and perhaps we'll have to, you know, keep praying about that and, and, and see where the spirit leads us on that. That, that can change the way we live our lives mm -hmm. and the way we think Absolutely. about our neighbors and, and the way we think about strangers, which is really what anti-Semitism is about. It's really what racism is about, is what we think about strangers. Absolutely. I wanna bring uh, Dalit uh, back into the conversation. I will give each of you a final word. I uh, want to recommend again the book. It's uh, Nazis of Copley Square, The Forgotten Story of the Christian Front. And uh, David, a closing word before we hear from Delhi and then Charlie. Well, I just want to close by, first of all, thanking you, uh, Tom, and the sponsors and the Concord Museum, particularly to thank uh, Professor Gallagher for a work of astonishing um, uh, history. You know, um, so, some histories are narratives about events we we know about and maybe change our minds a little bit. And some histories tell tell us um, something we don't know we don't know about. Some cover and some uncover. And I want to salute Charlie for having uh, done a fabulous job of uncovering something that we should have known about and that without him we would not have known about. And Charlie, uh, I, yeah, I'd like to thank you, David, for such high praise and and for reviewing the book so kindly. And thank you, Tom, for um, being open to sponsoring this event. I think the reason that I wanted to, that I contacted and talked to Professor Gross and contacted the museum was I have a, a really, um, I, I preached in the church, Holy Family Church in Monument Square in Concord. Uh, the people of Concord are very special to me. I've had uh, some amazing experiences, as, as David said, of, of, of being neighbor to people in Concord, of reaching out and, um, and getting to meet you. And so, um, I'm just extremely delighted to be able to to speak with all of you tonight through the auspices of the of the Concord Museum. So thanks again. You should know, Charlie. We had uh, Nat Philbrick here, uh, and when he heard you were speaking, he gave a big shout out to his uh, <laughs> Thank you. Your friends as well. Uh, so it's an honor to introduce Dalit Horn. She is the executive director at the Vilna Shul Boston Center for Jewish Culture to uh, uh, provide some closing words from Delhi. Great, thank you so much. Um, on behalf of all of the co-sponsors, I again wanna thank you for inviting us to participate in this program. Uh, one of the things I was thinking about during the program and uh, David, you and Father Gallagher shared too in the end is that this is a moment, not just in the context of um, where we are with anti-Semitism today, but in this broader context of global affairs and the fact that we're living through a pandemic that so many people feel um, varying degrees of loneliness, isolation, anxiety, um, and just that the world around them is not so normal and fearful. And one of the things that I find interesting um, about this program in particular is that it's an opportunity when so many people have to be apart to actually talk about um, differences between communities um, and to also have a conversation about something when people 
often feel um, is very particular to their own community. For the Jewish community, they feel like anti-Semitism is about them. To actually have a conversation with people from different faith traditions, from different communities, both today and historically, about how um, this moment in time, that moment in time, have um, have been kind of seen and experienced and understood by different people. And I think these are rare opportunities to engage in this kind of crosstalk um, that we that are kind of more exacerbated in today, given the pandemic that we're living through. So I just want to thank you because this is a tremendous opportunity to learn and to pause together. And I really can't think of a, um, a more fitting way to honor Holocaust Remembrance Day um, than to have a program like this on a year like the one that we're in, just days away from the events in Colleyville. So thank you, um, Tom, again, for organizing this. And it was a pleasure to be here on behalf of the Vilna. Great. Uh, and I want to give a shout out again to the role that newspapers play. Uh, David, you represent that and what uh, the Pittsburgh Post is that did. Um, uh, and uh, appreciate again the Boston Globe being one of our media co-sponsors. And let me specifically thank again our co-sponsors, the Concord Carlisle Human Rights Council, Hadassah, Karen Shalom, and the Vilna Shul Boston Center for Jewish Culture. And most of all, we thank our three speakers, Dali Horn, David Sherman, and Charles Gallagher. Uh, and we thank all of you for taking an hour out of your uh, evening to be with us uh, tonight. Uh, thank you and good night. That was great. Thank you all. <laughs> we got through it in an hour. That, I mean, even a minute or two to spare. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, we, we, we covered it beautifully, I think. Yes, yeah, David. I did, yeah, you did a great job, Tom. It's excellent.